Hey, kia ora. Welcome to church. My name is Cameron. I'm the pastor here at Village Baptist, and it's so good to have you join us for this online service because we've got a really good service lined up for you. We're joined by Brad Carr, who will be bringing us a message on what God is like from Exodus chapter 34. But before we get into that, just a couple of things from me. With the first school term starting for the year, all the ministries and small groups in church life are starting to come to life again too. And so if you're new to church and you're trying to find out how you can fit in and how you can connect into church life, now's a really good time to think through what small group might be right for you and what ministry might be a right fit for you to serve in. You can jump online to our website where we've got our Get Connected page where that can give you more information or you can contact us at the office. We'd love to help you find the right small group and ministry for you this year. But then of course we've got next week and next week is a big service as we have our Taste and See breakfast and our baptism service. So if you're new and you haven't come to a Taste and See breakfast, make sure you make contact with the office and sign up for that. It's a place where you have a free breakfast on us for you and your whanau and you get to meet the church leadership and ask any questions that you might have on your mind. It's a really good place, so sign up for that if you haven't been to one before. And also, if you haven't been baptised before but you call yourself a Christian, then I really encourage you to consider baptism. Baptism is a special and important part of our Christian journey, and I'd hate for you to miss out on what God has for you. So if that fits you, if you're a Christian but you haven't been baptised, do consider baptism even for next week and make contact with us at the office. But before we begin, would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, on this Waitangi Day weekend, we thank you that you are the God who destroyed the dividing wall of hostility in Christ. That the barrier between Jew and non-Jew, between ethnicities, was destroyed, that we might experience the unity that you have for us. So as we come to worship you today, we pray that you would give us a sense of worshipping with your church gathered across the world of many different races and ethnicities, that we may have a sense that we're part of something bigger than us. And that thing that we're part of doesn't always look like we do. Come close to us all, we pray, as we worship you today. In Jesus' name. Surrender my life, I'm in 
Hey, kia ora. It's very cool to be with you today. Uh, yeah, so my name is Brad, and just to briefly bring you up to speed with that, we, we uh, have been pastoring at Summit Church for the last 17 years, my wife Rochelle and I, a church that we planted. Um, but unfortunately, I actually uh, hit burnout in 2019. And so I've had to step down out of that role uh, now. And so we've been pursuing kind of a new ministry, waiting to see what God's going to do with us And we're stepping into a a bit more of a ministry to the wider church. We're still at Summit, and I still preach at Summit, but I'm no longer on leadership. But it means we get to do things like this, which is to fly into a gorgeous part of the country and hang out with with brothers and sisters who are part of our whanau and and enjoy this. So it's really special. And it's very special to fly back into Hawke's Bay because I'm a Hawke's Bay boy. I spent my childhood in Napier from age 3 to age 13. I was brought up in Tamatea. And so this is a little bit of a homecoming for me. I think one of the other times we came to Hawke's Bay, I dragged my wife around every house we lived in and every school I was part of and all that kind of stuff that you do. But it kind of feels a bit of a homecoming for me. So it's awesome uh, to be with you today. I want to ask you a question. Um, What do you think of when you think of God? How would you describe God? Our veteran African-American pastor Tony Evans tells a story of an elderly gentleman who was walking through a church building, and he looked into one of the kids' rooms as he walked past, and there was a little boy sitting at one of the tables, big piece of paper in front of him, crayons and markers all over the place, and he was furiously working on something. And so the elderly gentleman just went into the room and, and looked over his shoulder, and he goes, what are you drawing? The little boy didn't even stop didn't look up at the guy. He's just furiously carrying on and doing what he's doing. But he says with a really determined tone in his voice, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the, and the gentleman smiled to himself at the, the beautiful idea of that. And he said, oh, that's funny. I didn't think anyone knew what God actually looked like. He said, well, I will when I'm finished. <laughs> I wonder if we passed out crayons today handed out some some felt-tip markers, some pieces of paper, and asked you to draw a picture of God. What would you draw? Or maybe, like me, you're just not an artist and you shouldn't go near that. But if you were to use words, what, what words would you use to describe God? What adjectives come to mind for you? What phrases would you string together to picture what God is like? Today, I want to take us to one of what I think is the most important passages in the Old Testament that paint us a picture of what God is like. And it's a surprise, really, because so often people think when they read the Old Testament that the picture of God in the Old Testament is this this grumpy, harsh, angry being, and then Jesus comes in the New Testament, as you're going to look at as a church together this year, and Jesus softens God down, and I want to suggest that picture's all wrong. And so I want to take us to a passage, if you've got a Bible, we're in Exodus chapter 34. Um, You can use a Bible if you want, if you've got an app on your phone, that's good as well. But I want us to think for a few minutes about what is God really like? And the reason I think this is such an important passage, in fact, I would argue one of the most important passages in the entire scriptures for our understanding of who God is, is for two reasons. One, this passage gets quoted again and again through the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, So when the psalmists and the prophets want to go back to a foundational picture of God, they come and quote this passage. It's absolutely key to the theology of the Old Testament. The second reason why I think this is so crucial is that this particular description of God, this is not uh, Moses writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is not David's words. This is not Isaiah giving a Spirit-inspired prophecy This is God speaking here. These words we're going to read are God's own words. And so it's almost as though God walks into that little classroom, bends over the little boy. And in this passage, it's as though God very gently takes the crayon out of his hand and God's going to draw the picture. He's about to draw for us this morning a self-portrait of what he is really like. So it begins in Exodus 34, verse 5. It says, Then the Lord came down in the cloud 
and stood there with him, which is Moses, and proclaimed his name, the Lord. Now, if we're to understand what's going on in this passage, we need to understand something really important about the way that the Bible gets translated into English. When you read the Old Testament in virtually every English Bible, it doesn't matter what translation you're using, you'll see the word Lord in capital letters. That's God's name. His name is Yahweh. Previous generations pronounced it Jehovah, but it's probably best pronounced Yahweh with a Y. Two syllables, Yahweh. It's God's name. But Jewish people don't like to use God's name out of reverence for it, and so they substituted this title, Lord, and every translation committee through time has followed their example. So it doesn't matter what English translation you're using, if English is your primary language, you've probably got in your Bible the Lord, and Lord is in capital letters to tell you this is his name. But I think we miss something with that. I wish that translators would actually put what's in the Hebrew text, which is Yahweh. It's God's name. Because it makes a difference. Let me read you verse 5 with his name in it. Then Yahweh came down in the cloud, and he stood there with Moses, and he proclaimed his name Yahweh. What, is, what does that mean, to proclaim his name Yahweh? I think what it means is he's giving Moses a picture of what his name means. In the Old Testament, your, your name represented something about who you were, your, your character, your identity. So when we named our three boys many years ago, we just named with names that we liked, sounded kind of cool. But in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, they would give names to children that had significance and, and meaning and purpose. So often in the Bible, we read of people getting their name changed, don't we? Simon's name was changed to Peter. And Abraham's name was changed to Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. And, and their names have this poignant meaning in their story. So what Yahweh's doing here is he's saying, I want to tell you about my name and the meaning of who I am and what Yahweh really means and who I really am in my personhood. So in verse 6, he goes on, and he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming. Now again, in our English translations, what comes next? The Lord, the Lord. But I want to read it how it's actually written in the text. He passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh. Now when you stop and think about that, that sounds really weird. If, if you were to come up to me later uh, out in the foyer or in the cafe and, and introduce yourself, hi, I'm John or I'm Mary, and I said, hi, I'm Brad Brad, yeah. you'd think, what the heck? That's not how you introduce yourself. But I think what God's doing is saying something very important here. In the Hebrew language, um, they didn't have a way of saying the greatest or the most. What they do is repeat a word. So you're familiar with this without realizing it. So the king of kings means the greatest king. The lord of lords means the most powerful lord. Um, in the, the special tent, the tabernacle they'll build in Exodus, in the middle of that tent, the most important place, it's called the, the holy of holies. Well, that means the most holy. That's how they do it. So the king of kings means the greatest king. The holy of holies means the most holy. I think what Yahweh's doing here is he's going, Yahweh, Yahweh. In other words, he's saying to Moses, I'm about to show you the Yahweh of Yahweh. I'm about to show you the most important piece of me. I'm about to open up my robes, if I could put it this way, and let you see the very core of who I am. This is amazing. What's God like in his heart of hearts? What's God like at the very core of his being? Well, he tells us in the very next line, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God. The compassionate and gracious God. Yahweh says, this is who I am at the very core of my being. I'm the compassionate and gracious one. And those two words go together. It's not he's talking about two different attributes. It's one core identity. I am the compassionately gracious God. And those two words are stunning. The word that we translate compassion, which I think is beautiful, is a feeling word. 
The original Hebrew word, the root of it, is actually the word to describe a mother's womb, and therefore the emotions that a mother has for a child. And Yahweh is saying, I have this deep affection for my people that's like the love that a mother feels for its child. It's the kind of God I am. I'm a feeling God, and I love my people. But then the word for grace is an action word. That means I act on their behalf even when they don't deserve it. I don't only feel affection for my people, I step into their lives with concrete acts and expressions of love that they've never earned, that sometimes they don't deserve, that they'll never pay back. That's what grace means. That's what we thought about this morning as we celebrated communion and those stunning words that Paul wrote in Ephesians, that that's how God treats us that he has this deep affection for his people, and out of that affection, he pours out blessing and blessing and acts of love on the undeserving who can never earn it. And Yahweh is coming to Moses here and saying, this is who I am. See, and what, what we need to learn here, God, I'm just trying to make this technology work here, is at the core of his being, Yahweh is a God of grace. As he begins to draw this picture of who he is, as he takes the crayon out of the boy's hand and he draws the picture, he says, I want you to get at my core. This is me. I am Yahweh, the God of incredible grace. And then what he does is he adds four more phrases to this. He he piles four more expressions on about what he's like. And these aren't four more attributes. It's not like Yahweh's giving a list of his top five. He could have done that, but the way this is put together is it's one core concept and then four more descriptions that that modify that and help us understand what he's like. I would suggest that he's kind of drawing this flower. He's just told us what's right at the core of this flower, like a big sunflower, the heart of who God is is he's compassionately gracious. He's a God of grace. And then these next four lines become these massive petals surrounding the center that fill in for us and fill out for us. What does it mean that God's a God of compassionate grace? So it carries on. Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, that's the core. Now here come the petals. Petal number one, slow to anger. Literally, it means he's long-nosed, which kind of sounds weird, and he's not an elephant. Um, What it means is he, we would say, he has a long fuse. And God doesn't have a nose or a fuse, neither do you and I. But it's a way of saying that God is incredibly patient. And so the idea here is that Yahweh, this God of grace, is a God of patient grace. God does get angry. God does judge sin. God does pour out wrath. But you have to provoke him to get to that point. People have to push and push and push God to get to the point where he will finally judge. Judging is not what God does out of the core of his being. He is a God of grace. Doesn't mean he doesn't judge. He is holy and he is just and he judges all wrongdoing but he takes a long, long time to get there. Because he says, I'm long-nosed. I am slow to anger. He's the God of patient grace. And then the next line comes, abounding in love and faithfulness. It means he overflows, and again, those two words go together, with faithful love. This word love's really important. I mean, love's all the way through the Bible, isn't it? Now, this Hebrew word is probably the most important attribute of God in the whole Old Testament scriptures. It's called hesed. But it's a ch sound at the beginning. It's chesed. You've got to go hoik. You want to try that? Try saying it. Chesed. No, no, you need more hoik. You never thought you'd come to church and be invited a hoik, but you've got to, you've got to get a ch. Chesed. This is the primary attribute of Yahweh in the Old Testament. Time and time again, Everywhere through the pages of Scripture, he is described as the God of chesed, 
And mostly it's just called love. Sometimes like the old version of Psalm 23, 6, it's defined as mercy. But it's, it's more than mercy, it's more than love. The idea is God is this loyal God, this God of unfailing love, a love that never ends. He will never let you go if you're his. That's the idea. And it com- gets combined here and elsewhere in the Old Testament with the word for faithful. And what Yahweh is saying is, I'm this God who has deep affection for you if you're one of my people. And I act out of love towards you again and again and again, even when you don't deserve it. And the way that fleshes out is that I am the God of patient grace and I am the God of faithful grace. I'll never let up on you. I'll never let you go. And it doesn't matter what I allow in your life, I will always have you in my hand. That's the picture that Yahweh is drawing for us today on this piece of paper. And then the third expression comes, the beginning of verse seven, you've got it in front of you there, maintaining love to thousands. See the word love, it's the same word, it's chesed, it's the only attribute that gets repeated twice in this description. But this time it's not describing how faithful he is to each of us as individuals, it's saying, I have got enough chesed for thousands upon people. My grace is a limitless grace. We've uh, had in Auckland, over where, where we live, over the last number of months, a water shortage. I don't know if you've read about that and chuckled at us, not being able to put the sprinkler on or wash our car. We haven't been able to use an outside hose, don't flush the toilet if it's yellow, have four-minute showers, all kinds of things. Why? Well, because we just don't have enough water in the Hanua reservoirs and the Waitakere's. And so we've had to cut down because the the reservoir levels are are at the point where we've had to take action and let them replenish. What Yahweh is saying is the reservoir of my grace never needs replenishing. It's not like Yahweh has, there's too many people coming that I'm offering to grace and and love and, and give mercy and forgiveness to. So I've just got to put up, sorry, I've just hit my limit. I need to just not grace anyone for a while until my grace reservoir catches up. No, it doesn't matter how many of us come to God looking for a God who would love us and be passionate for us and would grace us even when we don't deserve it. We can come again and again and again, along with thousands upon thousands upon thousands. We do not drop his reservoir one little inch. That's what he's saying. I'm a God of patient grace and faithful grace and limitless grace. And then there's a fourth pedal here in verse 7. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness rebellion and sin. It's three different words to describe sin and its different aspects, but they've just piled together to basically say all sin, every sin, every wrongdoing that we can do, he delights to forgive that. He's he's a God that's leaning towards forgiveness, just waiting for broken, sinful people to say, man, I've stuffed it up. Man, I've got this wrong. He can't wait to bring forgiveness to that. And in the whole context of this passage in the story of the Exodus is that two chapters before, Moses is up on Mount Sinai talking to Yahweh. The people are at the foot of the mountain with his brother Aaron, who fashions for them when they request it this golden bull idol that they call Yahweh. And they bow down to it in this orgy of worship, a horrendous breaking of his commandments that he's only just given them. So the context of the story, this description, is this horrific failure and sin of God's very people that he's already graced. And it's in the context of heinous sin that Yahweh sits and he draws this picture of patient grace and limitless grace, and faithful grace, and forgiving grace. Some of you need to hear that today. Some of you need to hear that he loves to forgive, that there is nothing he will not forgive. 
some of you think you might have gone too far, that you might have failed in that area one too many times, that you've somehow moved yourself beyond the boundaries of his grace. And you need to hear his grace is unlimited. It's forgiving and it's patient. And when we turn towards him, this is the God we are turning to. The God of patience and faithful, and and limitless, and forgiving grace. This, Yahweh says, is who I am at my core. This is the picture that he chooses to draw of himself for us. But the picture's not complete. There's a final piece at the end of verse 7 that, to be honest, feels like it smudges the picture slightly. He says this, Forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet, but, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third or fourth generation. And you think, good night, what the heck does that mean? Makes you want to run out and quickly call dad, doesn't it? Just to make sure he's behaved himself this week. (laughs) That's not, that's how it reads, but that's not what God's saying. In fact, later in the book of Deuteronomy, God will explicitly say, that's not how I operate. I don't judge people for the sins of their fathers or their grandparents. Each person is held accountable for their own sin. So so what's he saying here? What he's saying is, is a qualification on everything he said. He's taken this remarkable picture that he has drawn for us, and he's adding one more piece to it, but it's not another petal to the flower. Instead, I I think it's more like the the stalk that anchors it to the ground of reality. What Yahweh's saying is this, this is who I am at my core. I'm a forgiving God. I'm a gracious God. I'm a patient God. My grace is, is limitless and faithful. But don't assume that that means I just wink at sin. And don't assume that that means, ah, she'll be right. And don't assume that means everybody's sweet. It's all kosher. God's just like a grandfatherly figure that will just go, oh, well, let's all, you know, have eternity together. No, Yahweh's saying, I still take sin seriously. So if you turn towards me, if you come into relationship with me, if you're part of my people, this is who I am, this God of incredible grace. But if you would live with your back to me, and you want nothing to do with me, then I am the God who judges sin because I am holy and just. And the warning he's given here is not that people get judged for the sins of their parents. What he's saying is when I, have to, when I am forced to unleash judgment on sin and wickedness, the consequences sometimes will affect multiple generations. So you think later in the story of the Bible, when God allows first the Assyrian Empire and then the the Babylonian Empire to come in and and take his people away into captivity, people like, like Daniel and Ezekiel. He's judging the sin of that generation and he's been patient for centuries waiting to that point. But there are kids and grandkids who will be born in Babylon, not because of their sin, but because they're reaping the final judgment that God had to finally bring. That's what he's saying. So this final phrase is a qualification. It's a a caveat. Just saying, I am this incredible God of grace. At my core, this is who I want you to understand I am. But just don't assume. That means I don't care about sin and wrongdoing because I also am a God of justice and a God of holiness. At his core then, as we lean over Yahweh's shoulder while he's drawing this picture, He's drawing us a picture to tell us, at my core, this is who I am. I am the God of grace. What I want to suggest this morning, though, is that you and I really struggle to believe that. For many of us, for most of us, maybe for all of us, we don't really believe We struggle to actually take God at his word. And we see this picture he's drawing for us. And we hear these words, 
I am the compassionate and gracious God. But because of our story, because of our brokenness, because of where we've come from, we don't always hear these words. See, God says, I am the compassionate and gracious God. And what some of us hear is I am the angry and frustrated God. We look over at the picture of God, that what God is drawing, but there's something at the core of who we are that thinks God's angry at us. The picture we have of God is of this stern-faced, frowning being who just knows that you're going to fail at some point this week, and he is poised, ready to bring judgment down on you for that. And God may say, I'm compassionate and gracious, but some of you here, I'm angry and frustrated. God says, I'm the compassionate and gracious God. What some of you hear is I am harsh and stringent. I'm like the headmaster that's just going to bring in a whole bunch of new rules for a new year. I'm a killjoy God. And man, I can't wait to just spoil your life with every rule that I could think of, whether it's good or not. And he may draw this picture in a way of trying to help us understand he's compassionate and gracious and all we can see is lines and lines of rules. Because we, what we hear is that he is harsh and stringent. Well, Yahweh says, I am compassionate and gracious. But what you believe in your heart of hearts is he is distant and uncaring. Maybe you've gone through a season of difficulty in life and you've cried out to Yahweh that he would intervene, that he would heal, that he would repair, that he would reconcile, that he would step into your life or the life of someone you love and he hasn't come through the way you wanted. He hasn't answered your prayer the way you wanted him to. And so now whenever you think of him, the picture you have of him, regardless of what he says, Yahweh is the distant and uncaring God. Or he says, I am compassionate and gracious, and you hear, I am annoyed and disappointed. Some of us carry the sense, don't we, that deep down God's just disappointed with us, that we're never going to measure up, that God just looks at us and shakes his head, says, oh, I'm not angry just disappointed and whenever we live with that sense of Yahweh of God we've misunderstood grace because you know what I always mess up I never measure up that's what grace means I'm accepted when I don't deserve it I am deeply loved and I shouldn't be. And I will never, ever repay all that he has given to me. We're, we're all a disappointment. <laughs> and that is the power and the wonder of his incredible grace. What's your picture of God today? See, you don't realize it, but you walk through these, these doors today carrying a picture of God in your back pocket. You carry an image of God with you through the week. And the problem is, because of our sinful nature, all of our pictures of God, they're slightly wrong. I've been reading a beautiful book this summer called Gentle and Lowly about the character of who Jesus is. And the author, Dane Ortland writes these words. The fall in Genesis 3, when sin enters our world, not only sent us into condemnation and exile. The fall also entrenched in our minds dark thoughts of God. Thoughts that are only dug out by multiple exposures to the gospel, the good news about Jesus. He goes on, the Christian life, in light of that, the Christian life is this long journey of letting our natural assumption about who God is fall away, being slowly replaced with God's own insistence of who he is. 
And I love this little sentence at the end. This is hard work. See, this in a sense, this is the Christian life. This is the journey that we are on. This lifelong journey, little by little, year after year, of laying out the picture that we have of God and letting God erase a little bit more of our picture and redraw it so that it fits a little bit more who he is. So that we'll come to see a little bit more clearly this description of him. So that we will come to believe in our heart of hearts that he isn't this angry and distant God. That he isn't this uncaring God. That he's not this angry and frustrated God. He is who he says he is. He is what he's drawn in the self-portrait. He is the gracious and compassionate God who if you have turned to him in Jesus, he loves you deeply. He's proud of you. In fact, I want to argue if this is not too sacrilegious for you, I reckon Yahweh's got a photo of you in his wallet and the angels get sick of him, skiding about his kids. That's the image that Yahweh has drawn in this fundamental passage of Scripture. At his core, Yahweh is the God of grace. And if this is really true, if this foundational piece of the Old Testament story, because this is Exodus, this is really early in the Bible, if this is really true, if this is really what Yahweh is like, then it's no wonder Jesus comes, is it? Who's Jesus? He's Yahweh in the flesh. So it's no wonder Jesus is like what he's like. It's no wonder Jesus will say the things he says because at his core, he's Yahweh, the God of grace. It's no wonder Jesus will do what he does. It's no wonder Jesus will act towards people the way he does. And it is no wonder that Jesus, Yahweh in human flesh, will allow himself to be nailed to a cross because that's the only way that he will be able to pour out grace on people that never deserved it. So my challenge to you today, my encouragement to you, is to realize, to be more aware of this picture you are carrying of God. And this week, maybe right now in this moment, Would you just take out your mental picture, lay it out, smooth it out under the gaze of Yahweh, just allow him by his spirit to clean up some of the smudges, to erase some of those dark parts, and just to let him redraw your picture of him a little bit more until the day we will all stand with him face to face and we will finally, truly believe that he really is the God of amazing grace. Can I pray for us? Yahweh, we are blown away that this is who you are. Forgive us for our dark, smudged, wrong pictures of you. Thank you that this is who you are. Yahweh, Yahweh, the gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, overflowing in faithful love, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving all of our wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Help us to really see you today, we pray.
Amen. The chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my Lord.
that brings us to the end of today's service. Thank you for joining us. As you go into the rest of your week, may these words ring in your ears. Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. May you go into this week and all that's within it, in the blessings of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.